Sure. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Um, really pleased today to be able to host Marissa Bell from the University of Buffalo. Uh, interesting story how I met uh, Marissa. Uh, it involves the internet, but not what you just thought. <laughs> uh, sorry, that just popped in my head. <laughs> Uh, interestingly, she had some publicity around one of the, the work that she was doing, um, and I just thought it was fascinating that we had somebody from the U.S. who was studying the consent-based citing process for nuclear waste in Canada, uh, so in a sense, very much independent of the Canadian Nuclear Waste Management Organization. Um, and then we started communicating and, and uh, uh, invited her to some other things and wanted to get her to come to Michigan to talk about her work. So, Really pleased you're here, and we'll roll over there about what's going on the camera. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'd just like to yeah thank um, Todd for inviting me here today. And despite it being the coldest day of the winter thus far, um, I've had a really warm welcome uh, chatting to faculty and students. Um, so it's been my first time to Michigan and Ann Arbor, so um, it's been really, really lovely. Um, so, as Todd mentioned, um, so I'm a PhD candidate in the very um, final stages of my PhD at the University of Buffalo. And um, I've also kind of started a, um, a research fellowship at George Washington University, kind of the next um, phase of my research, uh, looking into nuclear waste issues. And so today, um, yeah, primarily going to talk about my dissertation uh, research and a specific portion of it. Um, and so uh, focused around Canada's nuclear waste siting process and specifically around the concept of consent. So I'd kind of like to start with um, a bit of an anecdote. Um, so I conducted, I'm a social scientist and I conduct research primarily with, um, with people. Um, but I sort of went into Bruce County, um, an area, and I'll kind of explain the, the context, but um, I did field research between 2018 and 2019. And um, I wanted to kind of relay uh, a specific um, anecdote that a local community member had relayed to me when she was really explaining the most impactful moment that shaped the way she perceives and relates to the nuclear waste siting process, so the process that was happening. So she's referring to um, a specific hearing for the nuclear um, waste siting process, and she says, so most of those meetings and events are a waste of time, but there's one story that I like to repeat. At one of those meetings, some person finally piped up and said, well, have the trees been asked for their consent in all of this? What about the lakes and what about the rivers? And I guess the coordinator of the meeting was kind of a bit um, bewildered by this, but at least having the decency to pause, asked, how could we ever get consent from inanimate things such as trees or rivers or lakes? And this person says, well, you ask them. And the meeting coordinator kind of chuckled and said, you mean we just walk right up to them and ask them? And if we don't get an objection, then we just assume that there is no objection and we go ahead. And the person says, no, 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 no. That's not what I mean. It's like trying to reach anyone significantly different from you. You have to get to know them. You have to, um, yeah, you have to get to know them. So then how do we get to know them? Well, you spend time with them, you connect with them, and then you might begin to understand the ways in which they speak. And if you like, I could serve some type of introduction, could go hiking or canoeing, and introduce you to these lakes and trees and rivers. But if you do not wish to do that, then at least allow those who do have that knowledge to speak for them, because they have a right in this too. Do you hear the trees giving consent? So, and some might sort of shrug this off as saying, well, we're interested only in people and what people think. But then that brings another question, what about future generations, untold generations? How do you get their consent? 
And so my point really is that consent is not an easy thing to define nor obtain. It's embedded in the complex fabric of space and time and the different ways in which we choose to understand or misunderstand one another. And that's really what I kind of refer to as landscapes of consent in my work, and I'll explain that a little bit more. And so the broader issue that I want to tackle here today um, is an ambitious one, right? Who has the right to consent, and how are those voices recognized in this consent process? And the reason that I wanted to look into this and the real impetus is that when it comes to the siting of nuclear waste facilities, the social and the political issues are those that are really kind of bottlenecks in the process. They are the technical issues. There may be them, but the social and political are really what's um, preventing us from finding siting. And this is broad based. So, um, you know, we can look back in the US um, in terms of uh, Yucca Mountain and sort of failures of top down federally mandated processes. And Yucca Mountain, as of a couple of days ago, is completely off the table. And, you know, there's a lot of um, politics involved with that. When you look at the UK, <clears throat> uh, the UK process, they, they had found a local community that wanted the waste, but it got vetoed at a county level. And then in Canada, back in the 1980s, there was a deep geologic repository concept um, that was proposed by the AECL, Atomic Energy Canada Limited. And they developed this DGR, and they developed this um, process and it was deemed safe from a technical standpoint, but it wasn't deemed safe from a social standpoint. And so that's kind of where um, the, this consent-based process sort of comes into um, play. So while there are many facets to social acceptance, recognition is a significant component. Now, what is recognition? It's not just, so it comes from the concept of recognition justice, which comes from uh, environmental justice literature, um, which University of Michigan has a strong uh, history of, actually. Um, but <clears throat> it's, it's not just recognizing, it's identifying, but then also respecting and valuing and bringing those uh, voices into the decision-making process. So the big takeaways um, really that I want to bring into, into context and in taking the, these landscapes is that, you know, taking landscapes not just as the environment but also the people within them and the history and the geographic context. And the approach that we might take is one that is also cognizant of this recognition. So respect, inclusion, and uh, valuing those uh, voices. And this then helps us get to those questions of consent, of the, the who, the what, and the how. So returning a little bit to uh, our anecdote, so it was a little bit sort of out there. And the purpose of that really was to kind of get us thinking outside of the box, getting us thinking about different epistemological claims about knowledge and how we obtain knowledge and expertise. And so, you know, I presume primarily most, most of you in the room um, may be most comfortable with a scientific, a Western-dominated scientific way of thinking. Um, that is based on the scientific method and hypotheses and laboratories and experiments. But there are other sort of epistemological claims um, out there. How can we hear what the trees say? And yet, actually, when thinking about this, <laughs> I started to realize that as technical scientists, those of you in the room, may also be relying on the non-human to tell you a scientific truth. 
So, and this is not my background, I think this is <laughs> the background of many of you in the room, but when you look at sort of, so this is the, the waste management concept for high level spent fuel in Canada, and there's a, there's a ceramic barrier, a zircaloy barrier, a copper coating, a bentonite clay barrier. And so you might actually be asking the copper, you know, will it corrode or not? But anyway, then there's me, who actually, I'm the outlier. I am a social scientist. I primarily study the human, uh, human components of that system. And um, so I do qualitative research. I've gone and done field work that is based on participant observation. So going to these meetings and hearings and sort of understanding um, what the, how the process is unfolding. I also have done sort of over um, between 40 and 50 in-depth interviews with various stakeholders, community stakeholders, uh, local officials, politicians, NGOs, uh, and practitioners as well. And so I've really done this to understand the concept of the consent and how it gets negotiated. Who do we listen to? Who has the right to speak? Who is qualified to speak? And how might we evaluate consent? And what, are the, what is the radius of consent? And I think that these are really important for moving forward with citing because they'll produce more meaningful but also more successful outcomes. And so this is part of my broader dissertation research. So I just wanted to situate it within that research that um, part of it looks at the concept of nuclear communities and how that relates to kind of political economics and dominance, reliance on industry, um, and how that influences risk perception as well, and how then that influences the way citing process. And the second part that I'm talking about today that is about recognition, justice, <coughs> and landscapes of consent and then the third part is really focused to um, the importance of geography in shaping procedures and process. But so today, I'm really focusing on integrating and understanding the complexity of social actors in this um, process. So a little bit of background. Um, so Canada for decades has been working on its um, nuclear waste siting process. After that sort of um, failure of the AEC um, L concept, uh, there was a sort of panel and commission uh, report that basically said, we need to prioritize social acceptability because the technical issues um, were not the priority, the social ones were. And we also need to create an arm's length organization to manage the waste that is funded by nuclear utilities. And that, so that's what the Nuclear Waste Management Organization is. So um, funded by utilities, and, but sort of independent and arm's length. And they were created after the um, Nuclear Fuel Waste Act was passed in 2002 to try and figure out what to do with um, the waste and how to, how to go about this process. Um, after three years of um, studies, a lot of this was public consultation, uh, and they, they examined the technical aspects of siting. What should we do? Should we reprocess? Should we, um, should we bury it? Should we um, shoot it into space? That, that was um, a potential option. Um, and then looking at, so they settled on a deep geologic repository. But then it's like, well, how, how do we do this? Um, how do we manage this process? So they developed this idea of, um, or this concept of adaptive phased management. And so that's basically that it's going to roll out in different phases, and that it's adaptive in that it can sort of adapt to new scientific information as it comes out and things like that. And they also um, really focused on this idea of finding an informed and willing host. And so this willingness is really what signifies consent, um, not just in my work, but sort of more broadly, the US Blue Ribbon Commission classifies this as consent-based. So essentially, um, you know, the fact that um, it's, it's volunteer-based and, and we can get into that. Um, but it really 
so, so that um, categorizes it uh, globally. And there are some other countries that have also kind of done this consent-based citing, some with varying degrees of success. The UK, as I mentioned, kind of had its, had, went through a process, came to a failure, and is now sort of restarting its process. Um, Sweden and Finland have also had a consent-driven uh, process. And so um, it isn't a new process, but the way that Canada is doing this is quite, um, is quite unique. And in their mission, they really, again, they prioritize this social acceptability. So we're looking for use nuclear, um, long-term care of Canada's used nuclear fuel that is socially acceptable, technically sound, environmentally responsible, economically feasible. So note that socially acceptable is the first thing. So kind of really understanding and drumming home that that is um, most important. So in 2010, they basically, the NWMO went to some municipal conferences and said, hey, we're looking for volunteers for people to cite, uh, to, to be engaged in the learning process of to potentially host a nuclear waste siting, uh, waste facility uh, in the uh, in the future, and um, so I get this question sometimes: Who would volunteer? Well, 22 communities across Canada volunteered to engage in this process and potentially be a site. By 2018, um, it was narrowed down to five. Uh, five sites, um, these ones. And so some of them were sort of discounted due to geologic incompatibility. So they had volunteered, but there were desktop studies that said, you know, the, the geology just doesn't work. Other reasons might have been social um, acceptance or political reasons um, that they might have left the process. And then... Um, Actually, um, and so there were five sites when um, I got into this process and started studying it. But right now, there are actually only two. So one is in northern Ontario, in Ignas, and the other is South Bruce. And that's as of uh, last month. Um, so basically, when I started, this is my, the area of my research site, when I started, um, I just decided to look at, to focus, because there are very different um, sets, of, sets of issues and um, very different contexts. So I decided to just look at Huron, Kinloss, and South Bruce uh, for comparison. And so um, by today, so Huron, Kinloss just left the process um, about a month ago, or a couple of weeks ago. Um, so a little bit more about the context. So Bruce is about 100 kilometers west of uh, Toronto um, and the greater Toronto area. Uh, it's also on the shores of Lake Huron. And the region also has one of the largest power plants in the world by reactor count. So eight reactors at the Bruce site, operated by Bruce Power. And so this really, they are also the dominant uh, employer in the area, and they directly and indirectly, they drive um, the, the local and regional economy. And two of, the, uh, two of those eight reactors are also going, undergoing a major component replacement, which also brings in um, a ton of jobs and economic uh, benefits with it too. Um, it has a somewhat uh, sort of diverse population with some strong Mennonite communities uh, and also some indigenous uh, groups as well that both have reservations in the area but also have territorial um, claims and land claims that are still undergoing. Also, <laughs> kind of dr drumming home that importance of understanding the context, is there is also uh, another process going on for the siting of, um, at the Bruce Power site, for the siting of low and intermediate level waste. So they are also designing a DGR, a deep geologic repository, um, and but that process um, has recently kind of, I think, will also have a reset. Uh, because the indigenous populations just voted against it. So that um, influences um, the process as well. So 
Um, coming back to that just question, uh, who has the right to consent? And how are these voices recognized in the negotiation of consent? And I just want you to bear in mind that this type of research, it doesn't always provide all the answers. But it gives us a sense of important things to bear in mind and things that we need to pay attention to in order to create better solutions. Additionally, solutions that may work in one area may not necessarily work in another. And this is something that, so my background is, uh, is geography, um, and so kind of often like to emphasize that things can be um, place specific. So while there are some lessons that we can learn, it's also important to understand geographic context before trying to take some policies that worked in one area and just think that they will translate to another. So identifying some of the um, issues, I kind of categorize these into two broad themes to discuss today. And so one is defining the radius of consent. And this is supposed to be a like 3D model because it's not just talking about space, it's also talking about time. And then the other issue is um, these implications of being a nuclear landscape and a nuclear community and how that also might influence recognition and voice. So looking to radi uh, radius of consent, again, sort of the map denoting not just uh, space, but also looking into the histories and the layered kind of context in order to influence how um, we move forward. So, uh, radius of consent, yeah, it means two things, both spatially, kind of the extent, where do we draw those boundaries, um, is, you know, what does it mean to be surrounding, like, who do you include in that process, how far do you go, and then also how temporally, right, how do we account for um, future generations. So the NWMO actually has um, sort of a, a set of guiding principles, and one of them is inclusiveness. And so it sets up some of these, uh, some, some of these concepts, right, things to bear in mind. So the NWMO re must respond to the views of others, um, including surrounding communities, provincial governments, Aboriginal uh, communities, and even those on transportation routes. So there's some foundation for that, but it's also quite, it's still quite vague. Surrounding communities. First of all, what is a community? And second of all, surrounding, like is that municipal? Are we talking about the surrounding counties, surrounding countries? Where, where do we draw that boundary? And so one of the questions that came up quite a bit <coughs> is are they, so this is from a community resident, are they, the NWMO, including the United States neighbors? And actually there's no official discussion um, that I saw contextualized in terms of, you know, consent in the broader discussion of uh, uh, their American neighbors. And actually, so a number of resolutions have been passed this is against the low-level waste siting, but I think you can make a logical step that if they're opposed to the low level, most likely will be opposed to the high level. Um, but a number of resolutions that have been passed um, within the US, and some of these are obviously within Canada as well, um, but against this process, and actually quite a few, I think we're somewhere, <laughs> in Michigan actually. So, this kind of goes to, well, you know, how, how do you, who do you take into consideration when making these decisions? Then, so that's kind of talking about um, spatial delineation. That's one example. In terms of temporal delineation, so one of the things that, um, so this is a community liaison com uh, committee member. So the NWMO has um, sort of, with the municipalities, the municipalities set up these um, advisory committees or community liaison committees to essentially sort of um, work between the communities and the NWMO. 
And the purpose of these is it depends who you talk to. Um, but one of the, one of the um, committee members I spoke to said, you know, I'm just looking out for our future generations. That are, and he says, he points to, so a lot of the research I did was sort of sitting in people's kitchens and, and getting their sort of, um, you know, perspective in their own context. And so he kind of points to the, points to the fridge and says, you know, the, the little guys up there with their, in their little, you know, in the mud with their uh, dump trucks, those are the people that I'm concerned about. But also, not just concerned, but also in the context of future benefit. So when we talk about consent, it's not just about, um, you know, sort of all the, all the negativity and the negative perceptions. It's also about economic benefit and economic growth. So he says these are the ones that will have the potential for making something like this happen. And so how do you integrate those future generations? And so, you know, the NWMO has started within the past few years to... Um, integrate uh, younger children into sort of through STEM education and things like that to try and sort of prepare them a little better and have student representatives on those committees. So they're, they're sort of working towards that. But then it even gets a little bit more complicated. Well, what about um, the future generations that don't even exist yet, the untold generations? And... The, um, so the community resident I spoke to, she also added, uh, you know, and the ones who tend to be most uh, cognizant are women. So that might be one solution. But as I observed in this process, women actually tend to be less, and judging by the demographics of this room, you might be all too familiar with this, um, but women tend to be uh, less involved in these processes. And, and so oftentimes I would email somebody and say, hi, I'd like to speak with you. And they'd say, well, you know, I think you should really speak to my husband because he knows more about this process. Or, you know, my son, he works up at the Bruce. And so, and, and I'd be like, no, I just want to know, like, community, like, community opinions. It doesn't matter um, gender or experience. But there is a reluctance of, I think, um, women to kind of get involved uh, in this for whatever reason. Um, but so that's where, you know, that could be a potential um, suggestion. And integrating both temporal and geographic issues, there are other issues specific to this region. For example, Bruce County um, is, is absolutely stunning, gorgeous area, has a lot of tourism. And there's also sort of a, a history of um, cottages. So seasonal residents that they're, it's temporally complicated because they they have cottages that have been passed down through generations. So they have a long history in the area, but they only spend four to six months of the year there. So they don't necessarily, you know, if there were a referendum, they may not have the right um, to vote or whatever um, sort of definition of, of uh, willingness there would be. And that is also um, sort of vague and open interpretation. So there's a lot of things to kind of be mindful uh, in this process. And also important to note that, you know, consensus is often unlikely. But the important thing is that even though we may not reach 100% consensus, at least recognize and involve people in that decision making. So the second theme that I wanted to touch on was this notion of a nuclear community. So as I mentioned, Bruce Power um, and uh, OPG, so Bruce Power operates the site and OPG sort of owns the site and um, manages the, the wastes there. And so they are really driving um, economic uh, growth in the region. And by the sheer number of people that are employed, so Bruce Power employs over 4,000 people, um, but also the, the population in this area isn't that great. So 4,000 people. Huron Kinloss, I think, has 8,000 residents. South Bruce, somewhere between 8 and 12,000. So 4,000 is a significant number. And in addition to 
people's sort of the, the economic um, power in the region, that, that also means that the people who work there have expertise, they have knowledge, and therefore they have familiarity and comfort with the industry. And, you know, research does um, show us that uh, areas which already have nuclear facilities tend to be more accepting of further nuclear development. So this seems like a, a no-brainer, like an ideal scenario in which you know, people are familiar, comfortable, um, and that's great. But while the majority of people might be supportive of the industry, and, and the economic benefits it brings. Um, this may positively overall influence risk perception. So it may influence uh, perception of the industry in a positive light and sort of decrease the negative uh, perceptions of the risk associated with it. It might make people more reluctant to voice any opinions against it. So, um, another community resident and a business advocate sort of discussed this in a way. Um, she says, it's a very small community and people are very conscientious of rocking the boat. So I think they don't want to be the first to have voiced concerns. <clears throat> and, you know, in terms of the economic benefits, uh, people don't want to be responsible for the downfall of that not happening. And I also know the NWMO spends a lot of money sponsoring, so why look a gift horse in the mouth? So this means that thresholds for consent may actually need to be higher in this context, and to bear that in mind. The second issue is really kind of talking about cohesiveness of nuclear landscapes, and whose voices might get lost in that. So one of these is the indigenous peoples. So one of these groups in the area is the Sogin Ojibwe Nation. And you know, people say, well, you know, now the Aboriginal, that's a whole different kettle of fish. Because we've traditionally, as a country, we haven't done a great job at consulting with them. And we're just getting better at that. So in this domain, the NWMO has actually made some interesting progress. So they talk about, um, and this is specifically in their treatment of knowledge and epistemological claims. Um, so they've integrated more indigenous knowledge holders into the process. And so an NWMO representative talks to me about how they began these journey of water presentations. Um, so there have been two journey of water presentations that came from the indigenous community, a First Nations community because they had concerns about the water. And locally, we have concerns about the water because we're so close to the lake, Lake Huron. And so we came up with this in response. And so that's part of that adaptive where they sort of take feedback and integrate it and put it back into the process. So there is, um, and there's a lot of discussion of interweaving Western science with indigenous knowledges. So there is some shift in the discourse in terms of recognizing indigenous knowledges. But there is room for improvement in terms of different knowledge claims. So, and specifically in the discussion of um, any critical voices. So given the overall majority supportive of nuclear, the more critical voices not only are reluctant to voice their opinions and sort of thoughts and, and any, any <clears throat> sort of uh, perspectives, but when they do, they have been sort of disrespected and devalued in different ways, particularly through questions of credibility. So an NWMO representative talks about the time a critic was permitted to give a 10-minute um, discussion. So for each of the community liaison meetings every month, they invite a speaker. And, um, but this was just sort of a 10-minute public delegation um, that they were permitted to talk. And she says, I think if I recall again, and I wasn't there, but this is kind of just what I heard, some of the committee members and staff say that they didn't really find it credible. They didn't really have any credentials or publications. So then it was like, OK, well, they're just questioning this stuff. And I don't know how valuable they found it. So there's this sort of perception that anybody that is critical of the process is critical of it because they are uneducated. 
So even just a community resident says, you know, I don't work in the power industry, but that's something that I think people aren't educated on. And that's when the anti-nukes come in and say, blah, blah, blah. Um, but they aren't actually educated on what the waste means. And so this points back to, um, you know, a sort of well-known expert lay divide, um, but also the de sort of a deficit model way of thinking that if that the public simply have their perceptions because they have a deficit of knowledge, and if we are to just educate them, then they will change their opinions um, and feelings. And so there has been some work to deconstruct this boundary and um, you know, kind of deconstructing the lay expert divide. And I don't mean just by educating the public, no, but by actually understanding that there are other types of knowledge out there that are valuable beyond just having those credentials uh, behind your name. But there remain critical issues of which voices are recognized, upheld, and respected. And this relates back to that expert lay um, dichotomy in which there is room for improvement. So there are some sort of practical suggestions. Sort of the first step is to identify those voices uh, within the process. Um, once you identify voices and integrate them, you can then, right, you then integrate them into the process and you can then identify further voices that may have been lost or demeaned in this process. And then to develop place-specific and concrete mechanisms for inclusion. So a lot of the policy is often left uh, vague. Now, flexibility, fluidity, adaptability, those are seen as strengths. But vagueness and ambiguity can be seen as a weakness, and it can allow for other sort of elements to come in, power relations at play, to kind of complicate that process. It also means understanding so that context-specific policies that will work in that area. There's a low-level waste siting process. So maybe people are not raising their voices against the high level because they're busy sort of preventing the low level. That's a, that might be their strategy. And so really kind of understanding that um, geography. And so, and then, of course, sort of concrete mechanisms like including uh, diversifying in terms of gender or diversifying in terms of um, younger generations and things like that involving neighboring <coughs> communities. But, and that will aid in this recognition justice, sort of valuing and respecting and including those voices into the decision making which will hopefully lead to more just and sort of successful and sustainable uh, outcomes. So, oh, some concluding thoughts. So, you know, there has been um, a lot of progress in terms of inclusivity and recognition of indigenous knowledges and such uh, involving youth in the progress. But the institutions responsible for the citing process should consider being much more attentive to these landscapes of consent, which involves geographic context and the voices embedded within that context. The history, the concurrent processes, the social and political dynamics. And there's a need to integrate those diverse perspectives and understand which perspectives might be lost in the grand scheme of things and which might be demeaned or disrespected. And um, obviously, some of those concrete and place specific uh, mechanisms. Now, ultimately, while my research was looking at nuclear waste facility siting, I think that, you know, while they're also place specific, I think that there are some lessons that can be learned for the siting of other um, large infrastructure or infrastructure projects or other nuclear um, facilities. And some final, final thoughts. <laughs> So I couldn't go the whole presentation without a reference to the auspicious day that we find ourselves in. Um, but I think, um, so I wanted to leave you with a, actually a Slovenian proverb about um, St. Valentine, uh, which says St. Valentine brings the keys of roots. And of course, yeah, Professor Igor Jovanovic is, <laughs> I think he was under the weather, so he didn't make it, but <laughs> otherwise I could have said it in Slovenian. 
But it actually brings us full circle back to our anecdote, back to uh, the trees, the land, the water, the rivers, the trees. And while not, of, not all of us in the room may have that experience or expertise to talk to the trees and find out if they consent or not, at least I hope I've given you sort of some sort of foundation for understanding the importance of recognizing these issues of consent, recognizing the various voices, and the importance of geographic context, and sort of all of these things in together into um, how to inform sort of uh, more engaged decision-making for more successful and just uh, outcomes. So thank you. Thanks, right. Uh, and Marissa gave us uh, a bunch of time to, to ask questions. Uh, yeah, ahead. So Canada is a big country. Mm -hmm. My understanding of it is that most of the people live very close to the U.S. border. So the question is why, in looking for waste sites, did you just look for communities where there, where there were already were lots of people? Why not look for a part of Canada that's not, you know, still accessible, but where, where there might not be very That's a brilliant question, and it goes back to... I just went to his head. <laughs> well, it goes back to this issue of consent, right? Because, so, in Sweden, uh, for example, they, they started off um, back in the 80s focusing on geologic suitability. And so they went that way. They said, okay, which sites are geologically suitable? And then we'll get their consent. That didn't fly. So the reason, it was just the way that the um, sort of the process unfolded that the best strategy would be to open it up to any community and, and that, that is their version of a consent-driven process, that you open it up and the communities, many of these communities are not geologically suitable at all. And so you'd think, well, what's the point of even including them in the siting? But it goes back to that question of, okay, let's, let's leave it up to, um, leave it up to the, the people the, and their representatives, their mayors, to say, okay, well, we, we're willing to engage in this, then figure out if it's geologically suitable, then figure out if it's, um, you know, uh, in terms of... Right, and so right now there are two sites, one in South Bruce and one up in the north. There are various reasons why, um, I mean... South Bruce has strengths, it has nuclear expertise, it has that kind of, um, you know, all around it. But, um, yeah, it's, and it's closer. So first of all, a lot of the waste is already there. Um, some people say, you know, up to even 50% of the waste is already there. Um, transportation from Darlington and Pickering would be, it would be shorter to transport it there versus north. And so, um, you know, there are various arguments to both. And um, just because it's up, so the process up in the, uh, so I don't study it, but I've, you know, um, kept up with it. And in, uh, so at the point I studied it was Ignace, Manitouage, and um, Hornpain, but the process was far more controversial up there. It was super divided, like, like emotionally divisive as well. And so, yeah, I mean, it's also a great question for the NWMO and not, but I'd say it points back to kind of how do you achieve consent? Um, yeah. Can you discuss more about the uh, benefits of hosting the site? Because I can't see an, an obvious benefit for the community to have a waste repository. <laughs> Yeah, um, so I think primarily uh, the benefits would be economic um, in terms of attracting, um, I mean, there's a huge amount of money and a huge number of jobs in the short term. Uh, in the long term, obviously, those jobs would um, taper off. I think part of this is also they're developing like a center of excellence. 
Um, so trying to kind of position themselves as um, perhaps leaders or innovators in nuclear um, sort of nuclear topics. And so that center of excellence is, is around that. Um, so yeah, and, and, and quite frankly, you know, they're very, com well, <laughs> they, the big they, but the majority, many people within this region are very comfortable with nuclear. Um, they rely on it. They, um, they've seen demonstrated safety. And so for them, it's just, um, you know, like there are many arguments. The waste is already here. We have a legacy. We're doing something good for Canada or it's good for the region. Like there are a lot of sort of arguments that people draw upon, um, which is more covered in my chapter one, <laughs> chapter one, but really, you know, a sense of pride in nuclear. Why, why would you not want this here? We're proud of Bruce and, and um, you know, its, its achievements and safety records. So, yeah, a great question. Yeah, we'll do Ryan again. Just following up on Ed's question, um, so when you're saying it's open, it was open, mm -hmm. you, all the points you had originally, though, are still on the border, but was it, does that mean that just nobody from way up north came to you or, or came to the table with it and said we want That's a good question. And... I'm not even sure, like, in terms of population density, um, whether there are people far north uh, that would have engaged with this in order to volunteer. Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, I think some of them are pretty far, like, not, not really on the border with the US and not in populations. So I should probably... Um, Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So Saskatchewan has some, and I mean, but the, yeah, the the northern Ontario. I mean, it's it's very population um, sparse. Um, so, I guess maybe that's where the where the populations are. That um, yeah. Um, Yeah, right. So I mean, you, you, these are all communities that responded, but there's areas in the U.S. and areas in many countries that are just completely not populated, but maybe you want to throw something there. So how do you achieve consent to basically just getting the consent from trees? Well, so I think it's even not a question of how do you achieve consent, but how do you even measure consent? Right. And I have asked the NWMO, how, how will you measure consent? And the, the policy answer is the communities themselves have to provide a, demon, uh, a compelling demonstration of willingness. That's about as specific as we get. So... Yeah, I've been trying to get that. Um, and some people have said, you know, some people on the community liaison committees have said, you know, maybe the NWMO knows what they want, how they want to define it, but they're not telling us. Or we just don't, yeah, I mean, and so I understand giving the communities power. But I think that, again, that ambiguity and that vagueness is, yeah, it's, yeah. So I understand that you're a social scientist, mm -hmm. so your concerns would be focused on people. Mm -hmm. which, so my question is going to be a little bit away from that, which is uh, to what extent are you aware of the logistical considerations with, um, and how that drives this process? And what I'm getting at is that that large area of green on the top side of the picture, there aren't roads or trains going there. I don't think you want to have bush pilots delivering this stuff. So, I mean, that's a good point. Came up and it's probably a technical aspect of the siting issue. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to that at all? Because that's the thing about Canada. People are close to the border. But the infrastructure is there, yeah. Which is another reason why... You know, people would argue for the southern, um, the southern. Op well, it's one option now, but because it's much closer in terms of logistical um, safety, I do not know. I mean, I think that the communities just volunteered because they wanted to volunteer. They didn't volunteer because they have infrastructure or anything like that. But it's an excellent point that you point out that if there is 
like limited infrastructure in the north that it wouldn't even be a possibility. But I think that would have discounted communities rather than prevented them from engaging in the process in the first place, um, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, that's a great one. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Uh, so you, you gave the example of a community where they have a nuclear power plant, and so there's a lot of people in favor of this, and then maybe the dissenting voices feel kind of suppressed, and so you hinted that the threshold for consent might be a higher than other. Does it, well, I guess first, what does it mean, threshold for consent in this way? And second, does it go in the opposite direction as well? How, how low is the threshold? That's the second point is really um, so. Let's get to your to your first point of so. What I mean by that is, like, say, you know, if you and the way that consent is being or willingness is being determined in this area is through sort of these meetings and individual, you know, engagement um, with the community. And so I think that. Um, when, when I say the thresholds for consent, what I mean is that when you're evaluating, that you take into consideration that some people may be not voicing their concerns as much as um, they possibly would have under other circumstances due to uh, potentially rely economic reliance, but also, um, yeah, uh, economic reliance. Um, and so, yeah, and then... To your second point, which were, what was your second question? Because that one was like, does it go in the other direction? In the other direction. So, yeah, what? I, I guess, uh, okay, for example, if there's some uh, community with a few really loud, really authoritative voices, uh, very outspoken against it, mm -hmm. do you, is there a lower threshold of consent? Because you assume there's people in the neighborhood without harm speaking up? Or? Oh, absolutely it doesn't not. Sound no, no, no. How does it balance? Well, so just not to. So if there were a referendum or something, or if there, whatever their way of measuring it. Um, that you need to kind of pay specific attention to the voices that may be lost, as opposed to just accepting the status quo. That doesn't mean that if there are lots of loud voices, but if there were lots of loud voices, you just say, like, okay, we're not going to cite it here. So I, I don't, yeah, in, a, that, in that hypothetical way, I'm not quite sure how that would, um, yeah. I, I understand your question, but... Yeah, in terms of, yeah, I just don't think that, yeah, it, it wouldn't, you, you wouldn't achieve consent if you had lots of loud voices. So, yeah. Okay, uh, your, your presentation um, basically assumes a collective decision, and you never mentioned, um, and, and, and this is probably not normal in the context of the waste, but you, you, you never mentioned property rights. In other words, the owner of the property, uh, can they decide, do they have to listen to, to people outside of the, their property? Now, in the case of nuclear, we're used to that. But what is, the, uh, what is the point in which, you know, if I wanted to build a tall building on my property, do I need to consent? Uh, do I need to listen to all the small voices? And why is nuclear waste, well, what's, what's the break point? When do you go from, I can just build anything I want on my property to nuclear waste where I have to have consent from everybody and the trees too? So the point of property rights is um, really important. And the reason actually, so there was South Bruce and Huron Kinloss. And the reason Huron Kinloss um, just exited the process is because they had just initiated a um, land access options agreement. So basically, um, a number of uh, landowners, and so, and this is, uh, yeah, I neglected to mention that agriculture is also um, within the region, strong within the region. So there are people with um, large, vast amounts of land. And so, yeah, and apparently in South Bruce, um, there were, there was a race to sign up, and they, um, 
they were quicker than Huron kin loss, and so Huron kin loss basically exited the process. So um, there are now sort of individual landowners that were this, to, so I think that's options. If this is to go ahead, then um, they will obviously get paid, um, you know, some uh, fee or I don't know exactly how it works in terms of land leasing. Um, so that's how that works. But, yeah, I mean, and I think your, your next point spoke to a broader question. And, you know, so actually, even though my, my master's work was on um, nuclear energy and nuclear accidents, I, in between then and going back to nuclear waste, I actually looked at wind energy siting. And um, that's how I understood that there are all these issues that are relevant. And I think that, yeah, I think that there are lots of things that are relevant in terms of at what point do you... And I, I specifically think that um, wind energy siting in upstate New York has been problematic because of the way... And actually, I should point out that in this region, there is also a similar wind energy um, siting process that has been far more controversial and divisive than the nuclear waste siting process. But specifically because they went through this in a sort of, right, so I'm, I'm sitting down with various people saying, how do you define consent? And their answer to me is, well, I'm not going to tell you how I define consent, but I'll tell you what not consent is. This, way, this uh, wind energy, wind turbine siting, because they went around and they spoke to a couple landowners, they signed agreements, and they, they didn't, there was no volunteer consent driven, and, um, and the wind turbines ended up getting sighted. Um, and, uh, you know, they call it, oh, it's great, the sort of red light district, because it, fl you know, flashes red at night, and there's some great, um, <laughs> some other metaphors. It's really interesting. But the point is, is that when you put these two things side by side, um, very different outcomes, and so they could all learn from um, sort of a consent-driven process. Uh, but to answer your question in terms of, well, I can't answer the question, is it, at what point do you, um, at what point do you not need consent? Um, yeah. <laughs> but it was a, yeah, it was a great one, so. Yeah, one more area to wrap up, so I'm just going to ask uh, about the wind energy Yeah, so actually, um, so when I, I, you know, and I thought that studying wind energy, I, I really got into this and wanted to do that for my dissertation. Um, and then I was like, no, 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 my, my heart is in nuclear waste. I want to go back to that. And I thought, oh, you know, why did I waste all that time? But it sort of gave me an insight into how um, specifically, actually, environmental justice and energy justice, which is kind of these three things in terms of distributive justice, how you distribute the harms and the risks, um, procedural uh, recognition justice, which we kind of just talked about, but procedural justice. So if you don't engage people in decision making, you will end up with... Um, with outcomes that are just so, um, you know, in... So despite my accent, I mean, yeah, you know, I'm based in um, Buffalo. Uh, but within that area, the, the wind energy company had to, had to retract. And there were so many things in terms of um, just what they did wrong. Yeah, what, did, what they did wrong procedurally that basically, you know, um, prevented their process. Um, things, like, things like going around and signing leases um, without consulting other people, um, the fact that, you know, lack of local benefits coming to people, uh, the fact that, um, you know, upstate, downstate tensions, why are we always producing electricity for New York City? We don't get any benefits, we just get the risks, you know. And then you start, once you get that already, then you start getting... I believe the arguments for like uh, infrasound and the flicker is you know bothering me and you know the the bats and, and eagles and wildlife you get all of those but I think that there are deep seated issues that that lead people to um, to to draw on those specific um, sort of uh, yeah experiences so yeah.
All right, so that was awesome. I want to thank you for that. Um, great questions. Yeah, wonderful questions. Thank you. Um, and so I just want to thank you again. Appreciate it.